Bonsoir, merci d'être là. Je suis Damien Fouque, professeur de psychologie clinique et psychopathologie à Paris 8 et directeur du laboratoire psychopathologie et processus de changement, LPPC. Et c'est à ce titre que ce soir, j'ai la joie et l'honneur de dire quelques mots pour remercier le professeur Holly Priggerston d'être parmi nous. C'est une grande chance de recevoir une chercheuse de son envergure dans notre laboratoire. On en est très heureux. <rire> Elle est donc professeure de gériatrie, de sociologie de la médecine à l'université Cornell aux états unis Elle est donc ici en tant que professeure invitée. Et ce soir, c'est la première conférence qu'elle donne dans le cadre donc des cafés-conférences organisées par Geoffrey Gauvin, membre également du LPPC. Donc, merci beaucoup, professeur Priggerson, d'être là. Merci à vous d'être venu écouter cette conférence. Et je laisse la parole à mon collègue. Je vous souhaite une belle conférence. Alors, merci Damien. Euh, Peut-être un petit mot en anglais. Uh, thank you very much, Holly, to, uh, to come here uh, today. It's a very great pleasure to, uh, to welcome you in Paris 8 for uh, this conference. Um, for the rest, I'm going to speak in French, if you don't mind. Um, donc, last. <rire> Donc elle a dit, n'hésitez pas à me dire si jamais il a dit quoi que ce soit de mal à, à mon propos. On aime avoir des, des conférences interactives. Uh, and uh, Holly, you, you told me before that you like interactive, interactive conference. So, uh, on vous invite donc à poser vos questions si vous en avez uh, durant la conférence. Uh, si uh, vous vous sentez à l'aise de poser les questions en anglais, allez-y. Ce sera encore plus interactif. Si jamais vous avez du mal, on va faire notre possible pour essayer de traduire vos questions. Évitez de poser des questions trop trop complexes parce que peut-être qu'on n'arrivera pas à les traduire du coup. <rire> mais euh, non non mais allez-y euh, allez-y avec vos questions et puis à la fin si on a du temps on, on fera peut-être aussi une petite période de questions. Voilà. Donc euh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much uh, and uh, I'll let you go, uh, Oli. Uh, so at first I want to make sure can everyone hear me or am I being too loud or too soft or is the volume? And I, I speak very quickly, and uh, that's a bad thing, apparently, <laughs> especially in this situation. So if I speak too quickly and you want me to, sl like, say, slow it down, you know, just remind me, because I'll probably forget. But I am delighted to be here. This is, this is a big thrill for me. I'm so happy to be here to tell you about something I've been studying for many, many years. And it's uh, I think everyone sort of... I have the challenge of um, being an expert in a topic that everyone thinks they're an expert in. So everyone thinks they're an expert on grief. And um, in a way, they are. Uh, but in another way, we've, we've studied so many people that I think we've learned something about patterns of grief and uh, of adjustment and what's helpful and what's not helpful. So I'll be going through a lot of information. I realize that uh, there's going to be a time lag in the translation, and I should slow it down. So I, I think I'll stop uh, about a third of the talk. I'll, I'll remove it so that we can have more time to go over the material more thoroughly and to invite questions. So uh, please don't hesitate to uh, ask if, uh, if you want in the middle. I don't mind interruptions at all. I like them. Okay. So uh, this talk is going to be talking about uh, basically three things. There are, th oops, uh, So um, what is prolonged grief disorder? I'll be, I've spent my life defining what this disorder is. I'll be discussing the typical course and, uh, of how grief changes over time and the significant but very small minority that don't progress, that don't go through those stages that um, uh, are so familiar. I'll be discussing the criteria for prolonged grief disorder, which are pretty simple, but uh, controversial nonetheless. I'll be discussing a differential diagnosis. So how does prolonged grief disorder differ from major depressive disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder secondary to or following bereavement? And I'll show how, how and why they're different syndromes. Then I'll be discussing some of the, probably the most uh, animated part of the talk will be 
about misconceptions because there are so many misconceptions about this new disorder and a lot of people are very angry or hopefully they've worked through the anger phase but um, there's many are still very angry and and insulted by this even the notion that there would be a diagnosis for pathological grief so we have data to address some of those issues and and I'll share that with you then I work very closely with my husband uh, Paul Macieski and we have developed a micro-sociological theory of adjustment to loss. And so I'd like that to present this new theory to you today and the focus on social understanding and social meanings and how someone's identity is created through social interactions and how bereavement's basically a social event and requires social uh, uh, mechanisms to address the losses and deprivations of bereavement. Social, not necessarily only psychological. If there's time after presenting the theory and some web uh, sites and interventions that we have that apply the theory to web applica applications, I'll then get to some uh, psychotherapy interventions as well as a naltrexone drug trial that, uh, that we've gotten involved with. So without further ado, let me uh, talk about the evolution of grief. So uh, the most controversial, one of the most controversial publications I ever published was our testing of the Kubler-Ross's theory of stages of grief. And most of you are probably familiar with the acronym DABDA, um, you know, disbelief, anger, bar I guess in French it might not be DABDA, <laughs> but it's this notion that you start off with uh, disbelief, uh, go through anger, then once uh, you have bargaining, and once you go through depression, oh, sorry, too loud, um, uh, then you finally, uh, she proposed uh, acceptance. And as, although a lot of people don't like the notion that everyone's grief reactions are the same, so it's sort of a narcissistic insult to say everyone will feel the same thing and go through certain stages after they lose somebody significant to them. So I understand the psychological impulse to say, shut up, <laughs> you know, stop. Don't tell me when and how I'm going to feel a certain way. Who are you to say that? That said, we did publish data from our Yale bereavement study. And what we did was we used the Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief indicators for each of those stages. And we tested whether they, did they peak and change over time in the sequence that Kubler-Ross had said. And I, I'll show you data that support why we think that there is some truth to, uh, in general, people moving through stages in those ways. Um, the, the other just sort of more intuitive response to people who have been um, negatively responding to this notion of stages or states of grief is that it's undeniable when someone loses someone or something horrible happens to you, your first psychological, like you can't deny the first psychological response to that experience is this cannot be happening. This is, t this is just too bad. This must be a mistake. This is too bad. This is shock, in, you know, in English it's shock, disbelief, and numbness, being <clears throat> overwhelmed by what's happening. So that, or we, we have a phrase, a deer in the headlights. I don't know if that's, a fr have any of you heard the phrase, a deer in the headlights? Is no, no, no? Oh, so uh, it's an Eng American, Maybe it's not even English, but um, American saying that uh, during the headlights, when you're driving your car in the forest and then a deer jumps in front of your car, it should like run away, but it doesn't. It stops and freezes. So it, like like in that picture, it's like, huh? <laughs> you know. So that's that's the initial. It's a deer in the headlights. You it, you freeze you, when you're frightened you, and overwhelmed by something that's so threatening to you, you stop and freeze like a deer in the headlights. So very few people can deny that when something awful happens, that part seems, part, that part seems true. 
By the same token, uh, I didn't know, have you, are you familiar with a frog in boiling water? The notion that, so there's a notion that a frog in bo is initially in hot water and then the water gets hotter and hotter and it gets, it just adjusts to anything over time. Like, so the point is that a frog in boiling water ends up getting boiled. I had a very smart research assistant who, who was an undergrad and she's like, well, for, um, for uh, death, for, so Kubler-Ross was talking about dying, whereas the stage theory of bereavement is about living and living after the death. So for Kubler-Ross, the frog in boiling water, people get acclimated and adjusted to the new reality that over time they, they and there, no one's acceptance we think is a high bar. People don't, they're not like, oh yes, okay, I'm gonna die, I'm fine with it. But they do, they do realize that uh, ultimately they come to a recognition, a, a, a reintegration of their new reality, that this is, this is what's happening to me. I understand and acknowledge that I am soon not gonna be here, I'm soon gonna die. So that's, that's for the dying piece. For the living piece, uh, my smart research assistant said, that's really more about moving on afterwards, that you're, what are you getting reintegrated into? So here we took a picture of getting back on the horse again. I don't know if that's another American, like cowboy kind of thing, where you fall off a horse, but the idea is it might hurt, but you get back on that horse and you, and you ride forward. So I think that's what was meant by those two extreme stages in my argument to you is that, that those, those two aspects most of the time, not for people with prolonged grief disorder, that does seem to, those two, you, you can, it's hard to argue with those two uh, extremes, those two poles. So really what we're arguing about is those stages in between. Is there any evidence of those stages in between? So we tested it in our Yale bereavement study. Uh, we asked people of those different five stages. And the initial response was, uh, well, there were two surprising things. First of all, most people said that they accepted it initially. And even we do studies, longitudinal studies of dying patients, and they say that they accept it, but then there's disbelief. So at least in terms of what dying patients and bereaved people say, that's the most, uh, uh, most endorsed response is, yes, I accept what's happened. So that's the positive response. I think people prior to some of this work really thought the, the typical response to death of someone significant to you is depression, you're, that you're very sad. And what these data, which support our, our future work in prolonged grief disorder, it's really yearning. It's missing. It's miss and as I'll be describing, it's heartache. Your heart is broken. You're, you are so upset, not, not depressed because life stinks and everything is negative and bad things happen all the time and you feel helpless and hopeless. This is very person specific. It's yearning. This grief syndrome, grief, is wanting what you love and can't have. It's that miss, I want that person back. I want it to be like it was before. I want what we had and I miss this person so much my heart is broken, which is different from being sad or different from being anxious. They're related, but they're different. So the initial response, it's really primarily the negative grief indicators is really yearning. I, I miss this, I love, I love my mother and now she's gone and like I, I'm just heartbroken that I, I no longer have her in my life, is that, that emotion. There's disbelief and depression, they're much lower, and anger. This was in the Yale bereavement study which was mostly older widowed people. Anger tends to be much higher for violent deaths. Deaths from war, Ukraine, Israel, Israel, uh, Gaza, you know, in war, violent, horrible, horrific, there's, a, there's absolute anger and rage. This is not that. This is for, this, these were samples of older widowed people whose husbands mostly died of cancer. So the initial response to this was, oh, well, 
there really aren't so many stages so much as they're mostly upset initially and over time, over the first six months, for the typical older widow who lost her husband of cancer, it, it gets better over time. It declines by six months. My husband's a statistician. Paul Machiaski is a statistician. And he looked at this very same plot. And I went out for a run. And he goes, well, let me just try something. I went out for a run. I come back. And he's like, you're not going to believe this. But well, when I re scale the responses of these data over time to say, when are each of these symptoms maximally expressed? When are they the highest? When is the most disbelief? When is the most anger? When is the most depression? When is the most acceptance? So he reconfigured it, and he said, let's see when each of the, based on the plots that you just saw, let's rescale it so they're all in the same metric, and let's Look at the data to say, when do each of these things, these symptoms peak? And the answer was in the exact sequence Kubler-Ross had described. So the likelihood that that would be by chance be in the exact sequence was 0.008. So when people say, oh, there are no stages of grief, there seem to be patterns. There do seem to be patterns for most people that most people initially feel more depressed. There's yearning, anger, depression, and ultimately acceptance, or what we prefer is reintegration. So that was our initial work. We thought it would be the least controversial study we ever did because we were taking out the people who met criteria. This is, we just wanted to say, what does grief look like over time in people who are not stuck? And we got mothers of drunk drivers saying, who are you? They, this was older widow people dying of natural causes. We got mothers of drunk drivers misinterpreting these results to say, you're telling me I'm supposed to be better by six months? They, they misunderstood what the data were saying and what we were saying. We're just saying for an older widowed person, the typical bereaved person, that these, this, is it, that this is the pattern of how these symptoms resolve over time. Now, what happens is we analyze the data to, to test this question, Do, are there people who are different than that normal pattern? Are there people who are initially high and will stay high and stay high for years? And the answer to that was clearly yes. So I think most people before these kinds of analyses thought, you know, everybody is going to be in the red Thing initially. Everyone's going to be extremely missing the person they love the most at the beginning. And that basically the red line would go with the blue line, we'd get purple, and everybody would decline over time, just like you saw. On average, they decline on these symptoms of missing the person over time. And what we found is that wasn't the case. There were people who even initially, not all of them initially, so the I think I'll present some data on there is such a thing as delayed reactions where you're so overwhelmed initially, for example, with combat veterans who are fighting war. They're so uh, overwhelmed that they can't even be thinking about grief because they're dissociative and, and that's a prodrome to the ons uh, delayed onset. But for most people who meet criteria for prolonged grief disorder, they initially are devastated by this loss, and it's in a way much higher than the average typical person who is experiencing the loss. It's the top, like, 4%. And I think the notion was time will heal all wounds, and if they just, like Kubler-Rossa says, over time, they'll come to accept it. No, and I've been doing this for 30 years, and I get people saying, Either me, I, I am stuck, or my mother, or my aunt, or my daughter never got over. Some people never, in their mind, this loss, it, they rewrite their whole story and their life based on this tragedy of this important loss in their life, like the loss of a mother and early on. I think John Bowlby had, was the initial theorist who talked a lot about the the maternal attachment and the loss of a mother early in life. But 
those, are, those people are predisposed to having prolonged grief when there's a later uh, loss of someone, like a husband, after they have that prior history. So that makes you vulnerable to prolonged grief disorder. So what is prolonged grief disorder? Uh, it's this chronic, intense, distressing reaction uh, that's different from bereavement-related depression and anxiety. I, I'd be happy to share the data that show how the symptoms sort. I'm not sure if those slides are he here. But the symptoms are different. Uh, it's not, well, I'll be going through how the diagnosis is different for depression and PTSD. But it's essentially this crippling heartache. You feel like your heart's been broken in two. I mean, some people have asked me whether after a divorce or after a romantic uh, breakup of, a, of your, uh, someone you love, whether you can feel this? And the answer is yes. That's what, that's that feeling that your heart is broken because this important person is no longer part of your life. That's what we're talking about. And it could be, people think it waters it down. As a pet lover, as a dog lover, I don't think it waters it down. To feel it after your dog dies, after a pet dies. It, in the United States, some people have a goal or own a farm and when the family farm is taken away from them, and that was their whole uh, identity as a farmer or as their family farm or the family business. So it's anything that your whole identity is, you know, Freud would say, cathected to, that you are so attached to this idea and that is taken away from you. you the word for bereavement comes from the word robbed. So you feel like you've been robbed of what you need to make you who you are. And for s most people adjust to it. No one ever is happy about the situation, but most, the vast majority of people will adjust to it. But the people with prolonged grief disorder are crippled by it. And their whole s story is now shaped, the rest of their life is by this horrible tragedy that this person, that they felt like they needed to feel like that person made them feel like who they were and was it so important to them has been taken, th they're angry. It's been, this, they need this person. This person made them feel safe and not scared and reassured them of where they were in the world and this person's gone. So they feel like a boat without a rudder. So that's, I, I hope I've captured like why it's, it's both qualitative and quantitatively different than a typical grief reaction. This is like someone's taken a rug and pulled it out from under you, and now you've got to figure out how to be balanced again, and you just feel so unsettled and out of balance. So uh, we've been studying this across the world, including in France and UK and China and in uh, Japan, in India, in South Africa, in Brazil, all over the world, people have taken these criteria and validated uh, our symptoms that uh, of the scale of, it, we used to call it inventory of complicated grief, uh, but this notion that this, these grief symptoms um, can be universal and can form in a significant minority, even factoring in cultural differences, was, which was really important. Um, in different cultural manifestations of what that loss looks like, that there could be a recognizable, standardized, agreed upon and uniform set of criteria that would identify that group of people that had that feeling that the, the rug was taken out from under them. And so we had proposed this in 2010 to DSM-5, and there was a competing group that proposed, said that they had other criteria which they didn't have, said they had evidence which at that time they didn't have. It was, there was a lot of political back and forth about why in 2010 uh, it was not admitted and they said they wanted more data. So fast forward to 2019, the DSM-5 reconsidered it. I think it was motivated to catch up because the ICD-11 uh, with uh, Andres Merker had already adopted prolonged grief disorder, called it prolonged grief disorder, and people were agree recognizing it and using it to treat people. And it was a clinically useful, valid diagnosis. I think DSM-5 is like, okay, well, if it's in DSM-11, I mean, if it's in ICD-11, 
we're falling behind the world and we need to catch up and, and admit it. So we had a, another workshop where we, we presented data, uh, others uh, presented some case histories, and the team, uh, Michael first, uh, some, some of the leaders in psych American psychiatry hammered out a version of the criteria which looked a lot like our PLOS medicine di di diagnostic, provisional diagnostic criteria. We were sent off to use various data sets from all over the world. Uh, there were three teams that went off to use their data to validate those criteria. And here, I don't know if you probably can't see them. Um, and I think I'll, I'll be going through what the criteria are. But these were them. And, uh, and they agreed that de the data supported that, yes, it, it, this could be a, a recognized syndrome, and that based on the data, it was clinically useful to have a new diagnosis that was different from depression and PTSD, and that it would help with reimbursement from insurance companies, which I don't know if that's an issue in France. Uh, money <laughs> that uh, that people so if it's a diagnostic code everything in America is fueled by money so if there's a diagnostic code um, your therapist can get money from your insurance company because it's a billable recognized problem rather than a not undiagnosed problem so there's an there's a motivation for um, insurance companies to recognize that this can be an actual thing and then get reimbursed to treat people for this thing. Otherwise, what are you treating them for? It's also clinically useful because once it's established and recognized in the DSM, then it means that then there people will be interested in finding new treatments that might work better than old treatments for what that new disorder is. And the um, I, I'll be giving another talk later where I, I say ha the way we kind of stumbled onto this new disorder was, um, I was I'm a sociologist and I was my husband was at Pittsburgh and they didn't know what to do with me. So they stuck me in the late life mood disorders uh, geriatric psychiatry clinic because I was studying death. So they're like, okay, let's stick her with old people. And... Um, I noticed that the data were saying that the depression and the anxiety were being treated very well, very effectively for older people who were bereaved and widowed. And those, their scores on like the Hamilton D depression, the HAM anxiety, those were going down and they were so happy. And I was not socialized to psychiatry and thinking about things in that way. And so I said, but their grief scores on the Texas Revised Inventory of Grief were not moving. And they're like, we don't care. That's not a diagnostic entity. Like, why, why do we care? Like, that's, that's just normal. That's the normal part. We don't need to treat that. So I said, well, that's an empirical, que an empirical question. You don't know if the grief might be more distressing and disabling and disruptive than the depression because you've never even looked at it. You know, and they're like, well, we don't even know if it's really that different than depression. So that, that's what sort of stimulated the, the interest in trying to understand the parameters of this new disorder was like, why is it not respond? So that, that's how we got into it. Why is it not responding to antidepressant treatments and interpersonal psychotherapy, which was for depression of, of bereavement? So the differential diagnosis, oh, okay. So. So we, we got a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health to use uh, standardized patients that were given scripts. And these are actors. So um, I presented this a long time ago in Paris, and everyone got very upset and was crying. Don't worry. Th these, this, these are actors. Apparently, they're better actors than I imagined. They're, they're actors acting out uh, the role of these different disorders. And they're describing the class, they're sort of demonstrating what it looks like. And this is for, uh, pro this is the prolonged grief disorder one. I wanted to come in today to talk to someone Thank because you, your yeah. intern has suggested you needed some help coping with the death of your, of your husband, Henry. I'm so sorry about your loss. Why don't we start by my just asking you how you've been feeling the past few weeks? Well, uh, oh, here? Oh, yeah. I guess I'm just numb. 
Henry passed away about a year ago, and uh, oh, I just find myself missing him so much. Um, he was my everything. I uh, just haven't been feeling myself since he died. And I miss him so much, it hurts. I mean, physically hurts. It's like this wave of pain. And when it doesn't hurt, I just feel numb, like I'm kind of dead inside. I just don't know who I am without him. I don't know how to act. Sometimes I ask myself, what is my place in this world? I feel so alone. I just can't believe this happened. I've been sleeping in his pajamas. Is that crazy? I just like to feel that I can smell him and it makes me feel like he's not gone. I, I keep trying to keep busy so that I'll take my mind off of him. So I, I made this calendar and I, I put down chores that I could do every day. When I'm not busy, all I think about is how much I miss him. Mm -hmm. And if I find something of his around the house, I just break into tears. Oh, I'm so sorry. Have you been receiving any kind of support from your family, even your friends or your, or your community, anybody? Well, um, I do have some friends, and uh, they try to help me. They invite me to go to lunch or to a movie, but I just don't feel like it. They don't understand what I'm going through. I don't want to start over. I want things back the way they were. You know, in, in, in looking back on your, on your life and on some of the challenges that you faced, Sometimes it's helpful to know, are there any life experiences that this loss brings up for you? Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, my mother died when I was very young, eight years old. My father remarried, but my, my stepmom wasn't very warm or loving. So I guess, um, I guess that's kind of the way it felt when I lost Henry. But um, he, should, he promised me that he would everything would be okay. Is there anything that's comforted you during this difficult time? Well, um, yeah, I do smoke. And so um, when things get really tough, I, I go outside and have a cigarette. The other thing that comforts me is uh, being around where, where I can feel him. I just, I just want to be close to him. I don't like going to the places where we used to visit even the grocery store, because they remind me of how much I miss him. Okay, so I think that that captures uh, what prolonged grief disorder is like, and you may be wondering, how does that differ from typical grief, a typical grief reaction? So um, we'll, we'll give you a, a, a taste of what typical grief looks like. Really nice to meet you. You mentioned on the phone that you wanted to come in today because your internist suggested that you needed some help coping with the death of your daughter, Jaina. It's such a tragedy, and I'm so, so sorry. Why don't we start by my asking you how you've been feeling over the past few weeks? Uh, well, my daughter died 14 months ago. I'm feeling really sad and missing her so much. These some days I'm, I'm, I'm fine, you know. It's just when I'm reminded of her, I, it's when I get so um, sad and teary. I know, you know, my husband and the kids and I will all be reunited one day. Yeah. It's just that I, I, uh, I struggle getting back into my old rhythm. And Jaina and I did everything together. She moved in with us when she came back from college. I have a T-shirt of hers that I, I clutch just to feel connected to her. My sister keeps telling me, you know, get rid of Jaina's things so I'm not reminded of her when I go in her bedroom. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't want to do that. Is that crazy? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> it doesn't bother me that it's there. I like feeling connected to her. You know, you mentioned your sister, and I'm wondering, are you getting any kind of support from family, friends, or even community? Yeah. The kids are great, you know. We really lucked out. I mean, 
their husbands, their wives. They didn't want to, you know, didn't want to um, be far away from the family, so they live kind of near me, so I can just oh, go to their house for dinner. Great, yeah. yeah, I go once a week, you know. And the grandkids, I love them. They're so, <laughs> there's something else. <laughs> This is how I get sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, I, I, I find myself missing her, and um, it's just like this, like, like, a, like a wave of sadness that. Are there any, you know, challenging life experiences that that this loss has brought up for you? When my grandmother died six years ago. Mm. It was sad. Yeah. Yeah. But she lived a long, full life. And um, I guess it was her time, I think. <laughs> I don't rem really remember my father, so he wasn't around much, and I don't know if that counts. Mm. You know? it never really bothered me. My grandmother gave me and my brothers and sisters just all the love and support we needed. And so, uh, May I ask, has there been anything that's comforted you? God. Mm. Yeah. God is my comfort. I am comforted knowing I can talk to him. I can pray to him for guidance. The, kind of, the church community has, has, has been a blessing to us, too, and the outpouring of love and compassion. Members of the congregation still approach me and share memories that they have of Jaina and how loved she was. And, and I feel so proud. We have, we have one more video, but um, it can be a lot to just watch all these videos. I'm wondering, are there any questions or any reactions to any of this so far before we go to our last video? So you're not just like watching TV. You didn't come here to watch TV. <laughs> so, yeah. I've, I've seen something, and I don't know if it's a real point or not, but um, for the typical grief, there's this thing where um, the person is able to get kind of out of herself. She's able to talk about like her friends, her grandchildren and stuff like that. And the non-typical grief person was not about it. Is it a real thing? The, the fact of being able to not being self-centered at this point. I have, that's brilliant. Uh, yes, and um, we're gonna get to a theory, our theory which is different than the psychological theories, of, which we're very focused on the psychological theories of loss. But our, our, the basic idea, well, maybe I'll, I'll get to it soon, because you'll see. But the basic idea is people who define themselves in terms of someone else. And uh, Parks had talked, to, a famous sociologist talked about the looking glass self, that you define who you are in terms of how you, you see other people see you. And that when that significant other is gone, you no longer know who you are, and, you, and you're all in your own head. And, and the thing that people with prolonged grief disorder can't do, but the, ever, the typical grief person ultimately, not initially, but ultimately can do, is get out of themselves and start interacting with other people and stop um, it sa sounds uh, dismissive, but there's a sense of a pity party. Like, it's my problem. My, I'm, I'm so in my own suffering, and no one really no understands how, how like, my life has just been shattered. And it's a very uh, self-focused uh, issue, and that's, that's part of the challenge. Is get, and that's, that's the actual reason why... People are so um, reluctant to embrace this notion of the naltrexone trial, which I won't be talking about with this group today. But the idea there is, in the nucleus accumbens, the reward center of the brain, it's been shown when people have prolonged grief disorder, they see an image of their deceased loved one, it's, it triggers the nucleus accumbens, which is reward. That's a reward. You're not going to go outside and interact with everyone else if you're so focused on what, what you've lost. So you need to, the reason why we think naltrexone will help is it will blunt that reward and say that this is the only thing that can make me, I need this person. It's this sense, I need this person. And this, there's anger. 
There's anger at the person. How could you abandon me? I need you to be the, my best me, and you're not here for me. And, and, and so it, it's, that's, you hit your, the uh, nail on the head, as we say. So uh, thank you for that question. If we could just start by your telling me how you've been feeling over the past few weeks. I've been missing her all the time. I feel so, so terribly sad. It was a one-year anniversary of her death a couple of months ago. I just can't seem to even function. See, it's even difficult to get out of bed in the morning. My wife and I owned a bookstore, and my son had to sell it. All I want to do is sleep. Life just doesn't seem to be worth, worth it anymore. I certainly can't travel by myself. So I just stay inside all day wait for my son to come home from work. It's been so difficult being in his house, you know, because there, there are so few reminders of Roberta. I, I, I don't even want to eat much anymore. And I have the worst stomach pain that never goes away. I feel guilty that, that I'm imposing on my son by living with me. My brain is in a fog. I used to love reading. And I, I would read a book a week. But now when I look at a book, all I see is spots on a page. Mm. I don't know. I'm so sorry that you're having such a difficult time. And it, it certainly concerns me a lot to hear you say that you don't feel that life is worth living anymore. And I'd, I'd really like to talk to you about that a little bit more. But, um, but for now, may I ask you, are you receiving any help from your family other than your son or your friends or your community? Anyone? Well, I guess it's really just my son. But I, I don't want him to be taken care of. I don't want him taking care of me. I had to help my mother take care of my father. It's, it stopped him, or it stopped me from pursuing graduate school. And I don't want, I don't want the same thing to happen to him. I don't want to be a burden on him. Do you think there are any challenging life experiences that this loss is bringing up for you now? Being alone in my son's house the television to keep me company. Definitely reminds me of growing up. My parents never did anything. They just stayed home, watched TV. You've been going through such a tough time, Leonard. Is there anything that's comforted you through this difficult time? There really isn't anything. Anything left. I mean, I... I don't have a bookstore in the house. And I lost Roberta. There's nothing left. I've been thinking about this, how much easier it would be if I could, if I could just end it all. I know, everyone's like, oh, so sad. <laughs> it's very depressing, because he's very depressed. Hi. Hi, I am wondering about the type of loss, and I, I want to know if um, the person who suffers a PGD is mostly about a tragedy loss or like a disease, and they know they will lose some people, and it's more about a typical grief or not. Yeah. So that that's an excellent question, and especially we um, had initially called it complicated grief then we were calling it traumatic grief because a lot of the symptoms looked a lot like PTSD with avoidance and intrusive thoughts. Then 9-11 came in the United States and everyone was sort of mistaking traumatic grief for PTSD. So we're like, no, it's, uh, people like the term complicated grief, but it's really prolonged, intense. These, these, those symptoms, as normal as they sound, 
uh, are very pathological. So the difference is, can someone who has a tragic death have both PTSD and PGD? The answer is yes. PTSD, I'll, this is actually a perfect segue because I'm about to describe the distinction. The difference in a nutshell is um, PTSD is more about fear and the how someone died. Uh, these horrific images and feeling helpless to prevent it and fear and horror. And the, the basic uh, emotion is fear. Prolonged grief is our snap fear. Like it's, it's the only thing you fear is living without this person because you, and the, what you avoid, like with PTSD, you, you avoid reminders. I'm about to go into all this, but it's a perfect question. Um, but you avoid the recognition that this person's not coming back. With PTSD, you don't, you're, you're worried about you're gonna get raped again. You worried about being assaulted again. And it's about fear and, and hypervigilance in the environment for all these triggers that make remind you back when you felt very vulnerable and, and frightened, PGD is the opposite in that sense. You're, people look in the crowd and they imagine the person's not really dead, and they don't want things that confirm this person's not coming back. They avoid the reality, and there are all sorts of triggers of things that remind them about what they want and miss. It's about the person. So with PTSD, it's about the how the person died, and with PGD, it's the who, the person who died. So that's a perfect segue into the distinction between major depressive disorder and, uh, and PGD. So I'll, I'll try to summarize it um, in pretty quickly. But basically, in, with, in major depressive disorder, there's no yearning. You don't, there's no yearning. It's uh, yearnings uh, specific to craving, missing, and that's the key symptom of prolonged grief disorder. There's sadness, because you're sad that you don't have this important person in your life, but in depression, like the man that you just listened to, it's generalized. Everything is dull and sad and heavy, and they just don't want to go on, really. And, I mean, PGD is also related to suicidal thoughts. In fact, it's a better risk, uh, it's a stronger risk factor for suicidal thoughts than de major depressive disorder. But th there's a generalized sadness, low mood that isn't isn't different. They can be cheered up by bittersweet memories of a person. So it's not this generalized, just unreactive de major depressive disorder. So that, yeah, there are bittersweet emotions. There's an inability in depression, like with that guy. There's an inability to find joy and happiness in response to memories of the deceased. It's all bad. Pangs of grief. So Colin Parks talked about those pangs of grief. So I don't know if any of you have experienced this is, it looks like a, a younger crowd that I usually talk with. Um, so I don't know how many, fortunately, I hope many, very few of you have had to experience this firsthand, but there's that feeling like things that remind you that this person died and you just, you just feel like a tightness, like I miss this person so much. That's not depression. Uh, PGD, to your question, is social. Uh, it's an experience of social interpersonal deprivation and pre precipitating need for reconfiguring your social network, and without it, you're stuck in your own head. Whereas depression's psychological, and that's an internal, you know, internal feelings about yourself, self-hate, self-loathing. It's chronic and persistent, whereas depression comes in more like the waves, is episodic. It uh, evokes, so PGD is, evokes identity disturbance, like who am I in this world? That's the other social piece of it. Who am I in this world if this significant other is no longer here anymore? That's PGD, like I, like just un, you don't know who you are anymore. That's not depression. Depression is, you know who you are and you don't like who you are and you kind of may hate yourself but not feel really, really bad about yourself. So it's different. And then uh, there's this disbelief, whereas uh, in depression, thing, when negative things happen to someone who's suffering from major depressive disorder, it's almost validating, because their worldview is bad things are always happening, and it almost confirms, yep, that's what happens to me. Like, um, as an 
as a sort of sad example, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. She grew, I grew up with, she was very depressed growing up. When she got her cancer diagnosis, she wasn't surprised. She's like, yep, I knew it was cancer all along. Like it confirms this negative expectation that th just bad things are about to happen. That's not what PGD is like. And with PTSD, to your question, um, yearning is not a part of PTSD. It's a preoccupation with thoughts and of the deceased uh, evoking this strong sense of missing, whereas intrusive thoughts in PTSD are scary. Like, you, you're afraid you're back in, in World War II, or what, like, you, you have flashbacks. That, that's, uh, there's avoidance of reminders that the person's gone, not an avoidance of being in a very vulnerable, threatening situation. Again, the pangs of grief, there are no pangs of grief in, in PTSD. It's personal, whereas for PTSD, it's situational, feeling very vulnerable and threatened. Um, so uh, basically, the, uh, they're very dis distinct, and I think I've reviewed most of it. I could go through some of the misconceptions. I don't know how much more time we have until 6.15. I, I think I'm going to need to make a choice and I'd maybe vote with sh a show of hands. I can review some of the very common misconceptions that people have about prolonged grief disorder and show with data how, um, uh, how we counter them with evidence that says we don't think that those, those misconceptions are true. Or I could discuss the microsociological theory uh, focusing on social factors in bereavement. Uh, by show of hands, should I talk about misconceptions? <laughs> that is such a no. Okay. Uh, or, uh, should I talk, or should I just stop talking? <laughs> I mean, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, or should I talk about uh, the social theory? Yeah, right. maybe I, 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 I could not. translate it uh, just in French uh, to make the vote. Uh, donc, uh, well, I, I, I think it was pretty obvious. Yeah, okay, okay. I think I didn't hear them say I should shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they, they were, basically, don't listen to those misconceptions, okay? <laughs> you can look at the slides. There's a lot of evidence to support why we did it. It's not based on any sort of conflict of interest, getting money from big pharma or trying to push pills on people who, or therapy that people don't want. People contact me every day wanting therapy for, because these symptoms aren't normal and they are struggling, and so it's a real thing. That's, that's the basic uh, premise there. So I'll, I'll be talking about um, our microsociological theory, I'll try to summarize it very briefly. Yes, so uh, my husband reads a lot of philosophy and that therefore I read a lot of philosophy, but he's, he's was, he started as a mechanical engineer and he's like, you know, Aristotle has a quote in the physical world and he says that nature abhors a vacuum. And we're like, well, that applies to bereavement. Um, so s n nature abhors a vacuum. S there's a, when someone dies, there's a social space. I think people think of, oh, someone lost someone. Someone's gonna be going to become depressed and sad because they, they, they miss this person. We have, our theory says that there's a certain vulnerability about who's gonna be in that top 4% or less that are stuck and disabled and can't go to work and are suicidal who have this prolonged grief disorder. They're most often people who have experienced a prior uh, loss, like for example, they lost a mother as a child or a primary attachment figure, so they feel, uh, some concern that they're gonna be abandoned but, uh, in their time of need again, that this is gonna happen to them again, and then when it does, they feel, to it's like someone, there's a Band-Aid covering that wound, that psychological wound, and it's ripped off again, and they feel very exposed and vulnerable. So it, but it's, it's a loss of not, it's not the loss of a thing, it's the loss of a person, and that's why we say it's social. And I think what's new in our theory is that I think there's a lack of recognition of a few social, the social space that gets vacated by when someone you love dies, there's a social space in your world that's absent. 
the person who made you understand who you are, the person that you used to go to the movies with or have a uh, go in and go to the bar with or go to the sporting event with or go to your kid's concert recital. That, those, so, that social meaning of who you are and how you spent your life and your relationship to your world is totally, for those who are vulnerable to diploma, it's the social piece that's missing. And, w and even if, so we have these theories, we have a, this notion of simpatico. So in, in bereavement support groups, there's a very well-established notion that not all bereavement support groups are helpful. A mother of a drunk, dr whose child died of a drunk driver, if she goes to a bereavement support group for an older wife of a husband who died of Alzheimer's disease, they're, they're not gonna get each other. They don't understand their social space and their social configuration. You need to match them on the kinship relationship to the person, like parent versus child versus sibling, and on cause of death, to your point. And so we've come up with a simpatico web app to try to link people to connect with people that they think will understand them and get them and understand what it's like to have their lived experience of what it's like to have that type of loss. Because talking to a therapist is probably helpful. Talking to their children, if it's an older widow, might not might actually be harmful. They're not getting, they're told to move on and they're like, you don't understand, I can't move on, I feel like a third wheel. So you need someone who under, you feel that that person has the experience, the lived experience to understand what it's like to be in your shoes. The other piece of it that um, uh, I, I learned was my mother died during COVID and I, I, and, and I couldn't be with her. So the social piece of being there was really important to feel that you were connected to this person so that you don't feel guilty after that person goes because you felt like you were supporting them. But the, the new piece of it to me is I realized after my mother died that not only did I miss her loving me and caring for me and defining me, but I missed showing her how much I cared for her. And I, I'm planning on writing a piece about the need to nurture. And I think it gets, maybe many people in this audience are, are younger and it's a developmental thing. But as you get older, you feel a re almost a responsibility and it's almost a need inside you to, people have pets. Why do people have pets? Why do people have children? Because you, you, you want to care, I think you want to care for something. So part of that social space that's missing when someone dies is that person that you liked giving a birthday present that you knew they liked that certain thing. You like giving joy to that person, like that source of pride in yourself that you could figure out what made that person happy or, or, or caring for that person. That source of support is another aspect of the deprivation. Yes, of, of course you miss the love that you felt or the caring or the sense of where you fit in the world based on this person, but you also miss giving. And, and I think people don't appreciate that these social needs are as important as the psychological ones. And so that's, like if I wanna leave this, leave you with some something is, Bereavement is a social event, and the adjustment is going to be a social response to that type of loss, and it's not all psychological. And especially for someone who meets criteria for prolonged grief disorder, especially for someone who might want to die and be suicidal because they no longer s understand where they fit in, and the person who made them feel safe and secure and loved, that person's gone, and they don't see ever... In, there's a word in Yiddish called beshert, which means soulmate. And um, a lot of the people who meet the criteria for prolonged grief disorder feel like the person who died was their soulmate. And you, you have one soulmate. Like are, They feel like there's never going to be another person who made them feel that way again. So that's why they're suicidal. So, so when we do therapy and some of our... Um, cognitive reframing is, yes, it's true 
this was a very special person and this person's gone. And you have, you still can connect with them with you know, continuing bonds in, in, and we have apps for that and it helps you feel still a sense of connection to that person. But there are people in your world who might be supportive of you and appreciate you in new and different ways. It won't be the same, but it might also be make you feel valuable and, and help you understand your self-definition. So um, understanding how so the social deprivations and consequences of a significant interpersonal loss is going to be key to helping people in the struggle to find and, and feel more reconnected with the world around them. And that's, more than anything, the key to bereavement adjustment. So I think I'll end it there. Um, and I welcome, if there's time, any, any questions. Hello, uh, thank you very much uh, for the conference. Um, I was wondering what about, I don't know how to say it in, uh, in English, but in French we call it the white grief. So the, um, le deuil blanc is like doing the grief of a, of a person who is uh, alive and, uh, and uh, struck by a, a coma state or a big disease. And where, um, where there, is, there is sometime this uh, caregiving uh, situation, but also a grief that is beginning. Uh, do you have data or known case about it? I about do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I sur I'm surprised. <laughs> uh, so we actually just got funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. And what we find is that pre-loss grief, not anticipatory grief, where you're sort of preparing. Pre-loss grief, it's based, so we have our PG-13R. We have our PG-12R, which is about the loss of the person from dementia and dementia, or you know, they're they're not physically dead, but they're they're not they're gone. They, and it's very common in, in dementia caregiving. So we have our online living memory home journal that we have for bereaved people that we've adapted for what we call dementia care pairs, and and we've shown that even pre loss, these narrative disclosures and these activities that help with the person with dementia remembering what, who they were. Oh, gosh, sorry. Um, Got to take this, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, do, so that, that, they, that person going through those exercises helps their pre-loss grief go down just by ex narrative disclosure and expressive writing and engaging in and making, making sure. I, one of the big things that people may not uh, appreciate about grief one of the fears is forgetting, is forgetting how special you felt about that person. And that's also another narcissistic insult. It's like, if, if I could forget this wonderful person, one day when I die, people are going to forget me too. And so by these online exercises where this pre-loss grief, it, they're going through this person's sort of dying before their eyes and they're losing them, not only do we help them build, uh, uh, we have an online Home, a little home where we have memories, their favorite memories of trips they took together. But all these things help it reduce their pre-loss grief. And we have published data that show pre-loss grief is a direct predictor of post-loss grief. And we have other interventions, which I'm not going to talk about today. I'll talk about in the next hour. Um, it, we call our Empower Intervention targets pre-loss grief and post -loss. It's the same thing. It really is the same thing. And that it by targeting experiential avoidance of people, for example, in the intensive care unit who were dying during COVID, addressing the grief that those family members feel about this impending death. They're sort of in that disbelief state, that the first state of grief. It's like this can't be happening, and they make poor decisions because they're not, ex they are in that state of shock. So we address that experiential avoidance, they get better end of life care, they don't have those regrets and the guilt and the shame about what happened. So it's a great, qu great question and doing something about it because it's not, it's not the good grief. It's not that they're preparing for the death. It's that 
these people are vulnerable to having problems down the line. So it's important to address it and not avoid some of these psychological and social issues. Yeah. The time goes, so okay. I think we'll, well need to Thank you very much for staying. You just, just before leaving, thank you very much uh, to... Uh, uh, merci beaucoup, je vais le faire en français. Uh, merci beaucoup de votre présence ici à cette conférence. Uh, C'était un plaisir de vous avoir. Uh, si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas à nous les envoyer ou les envoyer éventuellement au, au mail. Uh, que, uh, Holly, you put your email on at the end. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just feel in free case to email. you need. And... Uh, a very huge thanks to uh, Lukina, uh, Raffaeli, uh, Diana Anacona, and uh, Clemence Jacquet, who uh, organized this uh, conference tonight. So, uh, merci à toutes les trois pour uh, cette organisation, and thank you okay. so much, Holly, oh, oh, to come pleasure. here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.